Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here with a great special edition of the show. I'm out on the road uh, for a few days out here in the Texas Hill Country and uh, my first stop over here is over at Becker Vineyards. They were kind enough to uh, invite me in or, or allow me to come in and took a few, uh, took a little bit of B-roll. This is kind of the first time I've done an actual B-roll for the show. Uh, took a couple pictures, um, but uh, a little tour of the, of the place. Uh, we've got some vineyard shots coming up soon and uh, I'm here with Nicole Bendeley uh, here from Becker and we're going to talk about some great wine here. We've got a few wines set up. Uh, but first Nicole, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and, and also a little bit of the history of Becker. Okay. Uh, I'm the Public Relations and Tasting Room Coordinator and uh, Dr. Becker calls me the Major Um uh, I've been here for 16 years in May and just have gotten to see our business grow but also the Texas industry grow. And Becker Vineyard started when the Beckers were looking for a log cabin in the hill country, a place to stay out on the weekend from San Antonio. And they found this property, but with a larger track of property than they were expecting. Okay. So they thought, well, if we buy it, what are we going to do with it? And they decided to plant grapevines. And then after that, they thought, we have the grapevines, why not make a winery? Okay. Not quite the same story as me when I created the website. I created a name and then my dad a few months later said, what are you going to do with the website? I don't know. Review <laughs> one, I guess. <laughs> Because um, originally it was meant to be a wine at some point, but uh, anyway. Um, so when did uh, so when did uh, Becker start again? We talked about this already. I know that. <laughs> they uh, no no problem. Um, they bought the property in 1990. Okay. Planted the vines in 1992, and then had their first harvest in 1995, and then also added more vines like 2001 and 2003. Okay. Now, um, we talked about this earlier, um, all the grapes are Texas sourced, right? Texas sourced. Um, there has been a couple of times where there's been like a late, a late freeze and they've uh, sourced from like New Mexico. Right. But we have Becker Vineyards owns three vineyards and they also work with probably about 15 different growers across the state. Some in the Texas High Plains Appalachian, some in the Texas Hill Country Appalachian. Okay. Um, and that's, to me, it's one of the things about visiting Texas wineries is I know there's, there's some of them that aren't able to source all their stuff from town. I know, I know sometimes some harvests are bad and it, it just, just happens as this to meet the demand, but- um, Part of being uh, a farmer. Yeah, you know, and that's, I think, you know, in my visits to to these wineries, it's 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 also great to remember that this is a crop. It's not that's something, true. it's not something you just like go to the grocery store and get some grapes and just crush them and <laughs> make wine out of it. Um, you know, this is a crop and, and people are farmers out here and, and um, it's, it's a little bit different, I think, than what people see on TV and the movies that, you know, it's not just something magical. I mean, there's magical about it, but it's not just <laughs> something that's just, oh, we're just going to have some grapes over here and make wine out of it. Um, uh, lost my train of thought. That's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> anyway, um, so they've been around for quite a while. Um, about how many different wine labels do you have? Or how many different wines do you have? Me? At present, we probably make about 30 different wines. Uh, some of them would be like we have four different reserve Cabernet Sauvignons, and then there's some wines that are going to be blends. So it's not necessarily 30 different varietals, uh, but that would be for some of the reason why you see so many. Now, in for the retailer, you might see 10 or 15 different wines, but in the tasting room, we might have more just because there's some that are very limited production maybe 100 cases was made of that particular wine. Okay. And then we'd be out. We might only have that wine three months and be out just because it's so limited. So some of those wines, uh, strictly, you can only buy them from here instead of out the retail? Correct. That's okay. correct. And All then right. we also have an online shopping cart too. So if you, we want you to come to the winery, but if you can't, ha you can't come to the winery to buy those uh, rare wines, then you, we can ship them to you where okay. you're at. Now is that, do you ship just in Texas or you can ship around 
anywhere in the states as long as the laws allow it. Um, that's correct. We have permits for different states, and then there's some states that we're not able to ship to. And, and, and living in a state where it's hard to get wine shipped to, <laughs> wineries can ship to us, but like, I used to order from some online retailers, and then the Texas Supreme Court closed that little loophole that they were taking advantage of. I wasn't happy about that. That's okay. I still get plenty of great wine here <laughs> without going online for it. Um, There was something besides. Oh, so okay, so we we we, we uh, toured a little bit of the winery, but uh, downstairs you've got you've got the cellar room, but you also got the mm -hmm. library. Mm -hmm. So talk about that's why I want to go next. We're, okay. Where um, so there should be some B roll going on right now. Um, so talk about the winery or the library and what you do down there. Okay. Well, uh, roughly two months ago, we finished the library space. We have always wanted to hold back wines to see how they're aging and then also have some more wines for people to purchase that are looking for specifically for library wines. And prior to that, we had like two to three pallets of these wines just kind of moving from warehouse to warehouse. And so finally, we, we were able to dedicate a space in our underground wine cellar uh, in one corner that they have a permanent location. And we also renovated that space and we have a long table in there. Um, it's a uh, cedar from Mexico, very pretty, but where you can have like say 20 people doing a tasting of the library wines or also to rent out for parties and things like that too. And then the other section of the cellar is our single vineyard designated wines, uh, in this case all the Cabernet Sauvignons uh, that are gracefully aged in there. Right, and you were mentioning uh, that you just have the one, the one level you're going to be At this time. adding another that's right. Okay. And we're also going to add, uh, there's one wall that's still blank, and we're going to add pictures of the growers and the Beckers themselves. And then also have uh, a glass jar or uh, kind of a large glass container where you can actually see the soil. Okay. So the growers are going to give us some soil, and that way when we're talking about the wines to the consumer who's coming to visit that might not get to see those, those vineyards, they can actually have a little more of a visual of what that vineyard is made up of. That's, I like that idea. Um, in my travels to France, um, I did make it to uh, Dechem, and in their guided tour, uh, they have some samples in one of the areas, and they have samples of the, the soil, um, and of different samples, and they even have like a thing where you can see some of the old irrigation, uh, the old irrigation pipes. Um, so that's, that's a great idea, because again, you, you're, you're, getting, you're allowing those people to really uh, see where the, where the grapes are coming from, how the vines are being grown. So I, I like that idea. Can't wait to come back and see that. Um, so um, we've got three wines here that we're gonna be trying. Uh, so why don't we go over those real quick. Okay. This first one is our Viognier Reserve. The second one will be our Claret. And the third one will be our Raven. Okay. Now we've been making Viognier since 1996 and we're the first Texas winery to commercially produce it, but it's like a Chardonnay, but a little fuller. Okay. And they nickname it the Red Wine Drinker's White Wine for those that typically like reds and don't like whites. Now this vintage, the 2011, is our first vintage of a reserve beyond it. So we're really okay. excited uh, to have this, but we've never made a reserve for this particular wine before. All right, so what was what's special about this being a reserve versus your regular, your regular run with the Viognier? They liked how uh, the crispness of this wine came out, uh, the flavors are a little more predominant, uh, more pear, uh, more honey, just a little bit deeper flavor notes. We, we grow Viognier and then we also purchase from several different vineyards and then Dr. Becker, and this is really with all of his grape, uh, grapes, keeps everything separate and we're tasting them separately just to see how they're, how they're aging, how they're maturing. Mm -hmm. And then if we want to blend or we might not want to blend, we can also be seeing how they can layer with each other too. Okay, so with your wines, um, you don't you do not do any co-fermentation, you just, everything's fermented on its own and then you'll blend later? That's correct. We usually blend right before bottling. Okay. Uh, different wineries will have different ways that they want to uh, do it, uh, but for us, we just wait to the very end. All right, so even, even in the aging process, You'll, you'll age everything separately and then blend later. Okay. And just, you know, that happens, you know, not, it, it's, it's, it's just one of the ways of doing it. Some people do everything, put it all together and make it happen. That's and some, right. So That's right. I, if it was me, I would do it that way. I would separate <laughs> it all out because I'd want to, I'd want to 
build it that way instead of like just hoping it comes out. <laughs> just putting it all together and hope it comes out right. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and check this out. So I definitely get, um, definitely get that pear. I do get the hint of honey. Um, you know, it's definitely more of a fruit uh, forward wine. I want to say forward, not like a fruit bomb type of thing, but, <laughs> but um, it's not, um, it's, it doesn't have your typical citrus, everything mm -hmm. like, you know, lemons and grapefruit and orange type of citrus coming through or, or lime. You might pick up a little bit of dried apricots. Okay. Dried apricots. And uh, as it's opening up a little more, you can pick up a little bit of uh, it's like a peach blossom, which is a very faint, delicate flower. And I'll, I'll I'll go with what she says on that because I'm not a flower person, but I <laughs> but I can get the floral aspect of it. I'm really bad at picking up specific flowers. Um, it's just it's just how I am. Um, but uh, there is there was there's something that's a non-fruit characteristic that definitely is a kind of a floral thing that if I was in a flower shop I'd go like I smell flowers but I don't know really what one I'm, which ones I'm smelling and that just means I need to go to a flower shop more and smell flowers <laughs> is really what it means mm -hmm. oh please <laughs> so, I mean I saw the holes in there I was only sure that is the spit bucket um, um, and there was like it, it just a tail end before I before I tasted the wine, there was kind of a, like a, I guess the potpourri, but as a spiciness to it. Um, and even on, on, the, on the palate, at first I wasn't getting the honey, now I'm getting the honey a lot. Um, but I still got that potpourri, so a little bit of that floral aspect to it. Um, this is good wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I always let the people, I always let the wineries know you don't have to give me the most expensive stuff. Give me stuff that that's gonna be good, okay? Um, I mean, that's gonna taste good, you know. Um, and that's nothing new. It's on my website when I tell people to send wine. I say, this is your chance to showcase wine, you know. And I just have to say, I really like Viognier. I didn't, I didn't. Tell her I like Viani. I just said pick what you want. I didn't give her any guidelines of what to pick. Um, and she picked three wines that I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I like Bordeaux blend. So I mentioned being in Bordeaux. So that's probably why she picked that. I don't know. But um, I like this Viani. What does this retail for? Uh, our non reserve Viani is about twelve ninety five, mm -hmm. And then the reserve is about twenty one ninety five. Okay. Um, and this is, this is great. I mean, the acid isn't over the top it's it's a, it's a good medium acid um it's very well balanced um it, it's you get a great honey out of it but it's not overpowering um uh and the, and the pear is it's kind of like having a it's kind of like having a pear and getting a drizzle of honey on there you know and, and kind of biting into it um it's it's and you can get a little bit of like a, of a green apple aspect too it's true yeah it's true. so it's kind of like having a little bit of honey with green apples and pears and I mean, and maybe a, a little slight minerality on the finish, right. just kind of not predominant, but just very subtle there on the back end. And this is something where you know what I think about having is a fruit salad with it. I think it's just to enhance all that. <laughs> um, but any salads, I love spinach salads. You get you get the spinach salad, and you get the blue, blue cheese crumbles on mm -hmm. it. Get apples in it, um, little pecans because there's a little bit of sweetness. With and I'm not. I'm not really big on pecans, but, but when you're in spinach salads, I know I live in Texas and I, I just diss pecans or pecans, however you want to call it. But in spinach salads, they're great. I, I like them in that because there's, there's a bit of sweetness to it um, and a little, little nutty flavor. I mean, I think, it, I think it's an incredible wine. I, I like it a whole heck of a lot. And if you like pork, sometimes pork is a hard meat to pair. This will go well with that too. Oh, I can totally see this. Yeah, you get a, some pork chops on the grill. Um, and I, I could see, I could see really doing that. Uh, at Thanksgiving, we had this this cranberry type of chutney thing, and I usually would be like, "What's this?" It was incredible. It was cranberry and something else. I forgot what the other fruit was, but I could see getting the pork chop, putting <laughs> that on there, a sweet potato, have this. So if you're thinking about Christmas, see, this is going to be after Christmas. 
So when you had your Christmas dinner, you should have had this. Because <laughs> this is going to be on in January by the time I get through all of everything. But um, this would be a great, you know, a great holiday wine. So if you're thinking about next year, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, or just all year round. I mean, obviously summer, this is a do, great wine. And you can do some Asian food too. Oh yeah. But uh, something that's more on the saltier side, not necessarily uh, the hot and spicy, but kind of okay. like your soy sauces. It'll okay. Through that too. So you're having like your dumplings, you get the soy sauce. There the, you go. The, uh, <laughs> I worked at a Chinese restaurant. It's <laughs> making you hungry. Yeah, I know, right? I'm, I'm missing that place. Um, but yet you get your dumplings and you get the you get the sauce that goes with it. I can see that. It'd be a great, a great pairing. That's awesome. And when you when you pulled the Viadier, I was like, I know I'm going to like this. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the Claret. This is our Claret. Uh, this is a 2010 vintage. And it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. And it's been aged roughly 20 months in French and American oak barrels. Uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon is exclusively American white oak. And then the, uh, uh, the other wines will sometimes switch around between American and then also French and then blend them back, or I should say, blend them together at the very end right before bottling. Okay, and then you were telling me about Kind of how this wine started so tell me what was the original like thought with the wine well, when they first opened to the public um, they had a cabernet franc but a lot of the people were not familiar with cabernet franc and it was foreign to them so the beckers decided well, let's go ahead and add four more great varietals to it and we'll call it a claret and people will know what that is as it turns out about the same number of people understood the history of claret so they decided <laughs> you know what we're just going to leave it as is We'll just explain it to them, and they're just going to have to taste it. And usually when people taste it, they do enjoy it. And this is our, our fastest selling red wine here at Backer Vineyards, the Claret. I can, I can say that, you know, when I first started getting into wine, the, the term Claret really confused me because they really didn't, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that really that's what the English call Bordeaux stuff and, and, and all that. So, yeah, I would have been one of those people walking <laughs> in going, what's, what's a Claret? <laughs> you know? And this one, what I like about this wine is that when you swirl it, you smell it, and you taste it, and you start picking up some raspberry notes, but then wait a few minutes, swirl it, smell and taste it again, and it just kind of feels to these different layers. So you're able to pick up some nuances of dark chocolate. Right. Um, you're also able to pick up some more red fruit. You might even pick up a little bit of cherries. Um, it also has a little bit of an earthiness to it. Um, but it just keeps opening up on you. It keeps. It has. Uh, it has many dimensions to this wine. Uh, vanilla, vanilla mm -hmm. from the oak barrels. And I'm even getting like the little pepper part that the, the Cap Franc always loves to, always loves to sneak up on you. Which that's one of the things I like about Cabernet Franc. And the tannin structure is firm, but it's not overpowering. Um, it doesn't have any harsh edges to it. It's, it's definitely a, a smooth wine and you don't have, let me say, you, the tannins don't really hit you super hard. Um, you feel them, but they're like a medium minus on, on the tannins, so it's not like you're, this is wine you could drink on its own, mm -hmm. but you definitely can pair what, you know, pair a lot of stuff with it. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's got the fruit forward to it, um, but you still get that minerality, um, you, you can, um, uh, Get, I get a little bit of kind of a dust, not like the Italian wine dust, but like a little bit of that little dustiness, a little bit of the wood. Um, you know, I definitely get those raspberries. I, I kind of also feel like I get a little bit of strawberry to it. Um, and then you talk about the vanilla, I get that. Um, the green pepper is, it's there. I got it more in the bouquet, um, but this is another, another wine that you know, I, I like these types of wines. I like these Bordeaux blends. Um, I mean, granted, I, I went there and it was it was all you drank, but <laughs> it was wonderful. And I, you know, and I, I've grown to like that that uh, that style of wine. And um, I think more people should drink it. You know, instead of worrying about just a Cabernet Sauvignon. So, mean, although I do like to drink varietal wines, but you know, not focus on you know just a single varietal.
And when did you start making the claret? We made it, I think we made the first vintage, 1997 or 1998. Okay. Uh, so I think we had the Cabernet Franc for the first three years, but Dr. Becker here in the last couple of years has brought back having a single vineyard Cabernet Franc. And also for San Antonio's Culinaria, uh, which is uh, promoting food and wine in San Antonio. And it's the, la the re most recent blend was 50% Merlot, 50% Cabernet Franc for the Culinaria wine. Okay. And it's gone over really well. And that's, that's the one that says Culinaria on it, right? That's right. right so I that's see right. That. that. That's the one I saw over there. That's right. Which you can't see. I know you can't see that. <laughs> um, uh, See, I saw that and I was like, oh, I need to check that out. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. Um, and then, like you said, he also does, he'll also do some uh, just just Cabernet Franc bottlings, right? That's correct. At the moment we're out, I'm sorry to tell you the bad news. Right. <laughs> well, that's that's awesome stuff. And again, like we, we, we talked about that Cabernet Franc is really an underrated wine, or underrated grape. Um, and it's just one of those things where Again, I, I guess what, like as Americans, we we focus on the label having the, the great mm -hmm. variety on there. Whereas when you're you know in Europe, you know what what's in it because it's it can only grow that in those areas. So That's like true. you're in the Loire Valley, you can get a Chinon. It, it is Cabernet Franc. They don't have to put it on the label, <laughs> you know. And again, you know, as, as I've learned more about wine, it's remembering which grapes grow in which area. Whereas in America, it's it's anything goes, which is I think it's awesome too. <laughs> um, No, I don't think there was anything else I want to talk about on that one. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on because I'm really interested in, in, in the last wine, uh, especially because uh, I like the name of it. So we got the third wine here. This one is our Raven. And the Raven, this is like our fifth vintage of a Raven. And the Beckers were wanting to work on a premium wine, limited production. And Dr. Becker started working with the different blendings and he just really enjoyed how the Malvik and Petit Verdot were working together. This particular one is a 2010, 75% Malvik, 25% Petit Verdot. He originally wanted to call it Off the Calamar because the Petit Verdot came out very, very inky black. Okay. And uh, in French, uh, Off the Calamar is squid ink. And we said, well, you know, not everybody can speak French very well or have <laughs> accents just right. And even when you're cooking Italian food, there's some dishes that call for that. Not everybody enjoys it. Some people really do, some people don't. And then Mrs. Becker, she was, you know, looking at the wine, you know, judging the color, which again, the Petit Verdot just came out very dark and intense. And she said, you know, it's just so raven black and raven stuck. And, uh, uh, and then Dr. Becker also wrote some poetry on the back. Before he was a medical doctor, he was an English college professor. And he wrote Raven, a blend of Malbec and Petit Verdot from the Talent Vineyards talons deep in the granitic soil of Mason County. It flows like Texas summer night, augury of the dark and unseen, churning in both time, ancient and near. It marks the edge of one of many circles. And, and Mason County is just an hour north of us. Right. Some of our Texas Hill Country growers that we work with there, like Drew Talent. And is Ma Mason County, it seems like they're, they're becoming really well known for, for the stuff they're growing. So I keep hearing about Mason County from my fellow Texas wine bloggers, so. Well, they have um, a lot of that sandy loam soil. Uh, some of the growers, including uh, this gentleman here, uh, have uh, grown peanuts, and it's a great soil for that. And uh, I think they're working on getting an Appalachian within, uh, within that area, but a lot of these growers are in the area they call the Hickory Sands. Okay. And uh, so, yes, great for growing grapes and uh, uh, making amazing wine. They also said that this is one of those uh, wines that every year the, the blend will change. It will. Dr. Becker, when making his wines, he wants to let the fruit for that particular vintage stand out. So he will do, kind of like earlier we were mentioning, keeping all the barrels separate and taking all the different samples and tasting them. He wants to see how those, how those grapes are coming along that have now been made into one. And then um, he'll do, uh, blind tastings, um, so you're not being biased, and then uh, seeing how it tastes from there. So like this one is 75% Malbec, 25% Petit Verdot, 
the next year it might flip flop, uh, or it might be half and half, just mm -hmm. depending on how the fruit how the fruit comes out. Um, but also when you're doing your trying your wine separate, and then before you do your grand blending, you're also thinking of things like what is giving uh, a good mouthfeel. Uh, do you taste it? Do you have some that is showing mid palate? Does it have a long finish? You know, sometimes you might have a grape that has all this uh, all this wonderful all these wonderful fruit notes, and then all of a sudden no finish. It just kind of goes right. and just stops. But then you might have another one that doesn't really carry the fruit. Maybe it has more of the earthiness, and then you're like, you know what? This one has a long finish. Let's let's put these two together. So sometimes by themselves, some grapes and some uh, grapes that are making wine aren't as interesting. But when you when you bring them together, they really work together, and then make a whole totally different wine. So there's a there's an art to it. Yes, uh, it's not. Uh, we, a lot of people like to think we're just tasting and drinking all day, but there is an art to putting wines together. Trust me, I understand that one. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I will tell people, you know, about about the website, and they just like, oh, that's just so cool. You just drink. No, I, yeah, I don't. <laughs> After the show, I will drink the wine. I usually don't drink during the show. Occasionally, I will, um, but it's usually during the show. I'm spitting. Uh, and then, then that's like my my supply of wine for the week. And, you know, I just try to enjoy it for the rest of the week, or at least for a few days. Um, but uh, yeah, I totally understand that. You know, that people have that mentality that you know, we're just like being in the bar industry. You know, uh, the restaurant bar industry. You know, there's there is this perception that um, uh, it, it's. You're, you're partying all the time at work when, when you're not. <laughs> no, we're not. Afterwards, that's a different story. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's not all. What's my little phrase? I, I, it's not all rain dogs and puppy bows because I messed up one day trying to say rainbows and puppy dog tail or something <laughs> like that. All right, so on the nose, I get. So I get what I, I call the, the pie aspect. I don't know why you put aspect next to it, but I get this pie type of aroma. And with, it's just what, what I, how I think of like a fruit pie. So you get a little bit of that creaminess in the vanilla, um, but you get, you're, getting the, you're getting the fruits. And in, in a way, I guess I get like a crust type of thing. Um, but it just makes me think of pie, which is more just really just the fruit and maybe, the, maybe a little bit of that uh, vanilla or cream. So it has like little nuance, subtle nuances of cinnamon. Mm -hmm. uh, it has also kind of a jaminess, uh, right. jaminess from the from the grapes. Um, it's almost like there's a little bit of. I don't really want to quite say cherry, but um, I do get cherry fruit, though. You do? Yeah. Okay. I, I I was getting cherry. I was getting raspberry, but I was getting a lot of cherry out of it. Um, I mean, not overpowering, but. It was like at first my when I first put my nose in it, I got that I got more of a darker, I got a raspberry, maybe even a blackberry, but then I got like this hint of cherry that kind of came back. And there's also a little bit of, uh, and I think it's coming from the petit verdot, almost a little bit of an herbaceous yes. happiness that's coming through, and maybe a little bit of white pepper. Yeah, I just got that too. But it is, it's one of those things that people always tell you, or your parents always say, don't play with your water glass, don't play with your food, but in the wine industry, play with your wine, yeah. <laughs> and it helps, and swirling the glass like we're doing is opening up the wine so you can be able to smell it more, so it smells associated with taste. So as we're swirling the glasses and uh, they're coming a little more to room temperature, you're able to pick up some deeper flavor notes and, do, and different aromas too. This is a beautiful nose. I. I... I, I like the complexity to it. I like all the different parts to it. Um, no one part is overpowering the other. Um, it's kind of like when you listen to music, um, you listen, <laughs> uh, I have my degrees in music. So I will sometimes, I'll sometimes uh, relate things to music. But when we listen to music, um, at first you just, you just hear the song, but once you listen to the music, you'll start picking out, if it's been mixed well, you'll start picking out the in individual <laughs> instruments uh, whether it's a rock song or a classical <laughs> song, doesn't matter what kind, but you'll start picking out the individual instruments, maybe their their parts. Um, of course, it has to be well composed, uh, but also has to, the the person who once it's recorded or when you're listening to it live, it has to it has to be 
made well. And so that's where I'm going with this is that okay. you can you can smell, you get an overall bouquet, but you can but no one thing is really just outright overpowering it. I mean it's it's not like a twenty minute guitar solo happening. Okay. <laughs> so um Everybody gets their little bit of, uh, of spotlight. I mean, I would say the least thing is probably the fruit, but it's not like, it's not like, you know, he's the only thing going on. <laughs> mm. On top of everything we talked about with the bouquet, I also got a little bit of mintiness to it. Um, which is neat. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, it's it's not it's not again it's not overpowering, but it was like I got a bit of of a almost like a chocolate mint mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, on our study groups that we have on Monday mornings, um, one of the, one of the, we were doing a Syrah tasting, and so we had black teeth by the end of, of the, <laughs> the morning. Um, and luckily, I didn't have to go to work that day. My real job, um, but. Uh, one of the wines we all were talking about, like having like, well, two, two of the wines. One of the wines was more like the, the York peppermint patty. Mm -hmm. And then the other wine was more like those little Andy's mints, you know, with the, the green, the, you know, with the green mint to it. Um, this is more like that. It's not like the York peppermint patty, but it has <laughs> a little bit of like Andy's chocolate and mint type of thing. And I do get a little bit of herbaceous, just a little bit of earthiness too, um, a little bit of wood to it. But again, it's all nice and subtle. Um, tannins are a little bit more than the claret, so they're about medium to me. Um, but it's all well balanced, and it's it's darn good. It's tasty. <laughs> Thank you. It's tasty. You know, she picks some great wines. <laughs> I mean, I've had a lot of the Becker wines already in the past. I haven't had this, and I haven't had the claret that I can remember. Though it's kind of weird because it's been around for a long time. But I've had the Viognier before, and I've always liked the Viognier. Um, but I, I can't say I've ever had a bad Becker wine. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I was up here a few years ago for the Rambling Rosé, and um, so we had a bunch of different rosés, <laughs> and I can remember uh, liking all of them, and they weren't all Becker. I mean, they were from, mm -hmm. you know, they were from all over. Um, they do a blind tasting. And yes. You have to pick out which ones are which, and they do show you. They do show you. Yeah, and it was it was awesome. Uh, it was it was when I first really started getting into us. The, the 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 show was in its infancy. I think I'd only had about thirty episodes at this point, and I came up here and uh, with my mother, and we we were just I, I, I was still kind of new to all of this. I still you know they were talking about their get this that and the other, and I'm like, sure, whatever you say, uh, you know. But over the years now that I've I've done it a little more often, I. I I now get most of the things that people say they, they smell and taste out of it. But um, if you ever have a chance to, to come up for that, or just in just general come up to Becker, mm -hmm. uh, but the Ramblin' Rosé, I, I personally have done it. It's a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, I know that particular year, Jason Dainey was up here with two, well, he wasn't, maybe he was, with two brothers. They had like the, the pit out back. Oh. Okay, so I don't know if you still do that time, if you have food, if you have any food stuff going on, but that particular food. year, he was, I think he particularly was up here, uh, but that was great. It was a great little pairing, a little barbecue and, and some rosé. They tried to get some different chefs to come up and show what other things you can pair. Because to to the Europeans, uh, a dry rosé is is perfectly normal, but to the average American, they might think a dry rosé is still unusual, although it has gained in popularity quite a bit. And so with the Rambling Rosé, they try to like do little food and wine pairings that gives you ideas of what you can uh, can have with that wine. It's actually a very flexible wine, but it is a lot of fun. Lot oh of yeah, fun. it was it was great because you had I think it was him and I thought there might have been some other another uh, restaurant had been up here, but for sure two brothers was up here and I remember eating some great barbecue too. <laughs> um, and uh, that was that was my first introduction, really, actually, to to, to Dady's stuff, as all his concepts. Um, but uh, like I say, come up for Ramon Rosé. You also have like um, uh, one thing we actually didn't talk about prior, but I, I know about it. You have lavender fields. We do. Yes, th that's super interesting. <laughs> trust me. We have three acres of lavender fields here at Becker Vineyards, 
and we do make different lavender products. Chris Bernou is our lavender manager and she comes up with different soaps, potpourris, um, uh, lavender linen sprays, just all kinds of different really creative, fun and useful things with lavender. And the Beckers were just inspired by when they were traveling in Provence. And they thought, you know what, the climate, um, the area, uh, it looks very similar to the hill country, why not plant it there? And so they decided to go ahead and put in the lavender. And then we just started making different products with the lavender. Um, and interesting enough, it's one of the few herbs that actually has many uses. So you can cook with it, you can do like an herbs de Provence, put it on your fish, um, you can do it on uh, like focaccia bread, and other uses too. But also it has some uh, medicinal qualities. Uh, when the British were cut off from the rest of their allies in World War II, uh, the doctors ran short of antiseptic. And so they asked the English people, go into your gardens, bring out your lavender. And so for the wounded, they were wrapping lavender within their bandages uh, so you know they wouldn't develop infection. Um, it also, if you have insomnia, uh, some people put it in their bath water or spray it on their pillow. That helps you sleep better. Mm, okay. Um, it's uh, also supposed to get rid of headaches. Uh, the Spanish also say it helps prevent or helps keep out um, scorpions. You know that want to come into your house, you okay. can put that out. So there are no scorpions on property, right? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be any, <laughs> um, but just a lot of different uses. So it's very interesting. And then uh, we have a lavender festival that takes place uh, annually, and we invite different vendors to come out and sell their different products. We have lavender presentations about the use of lavender. Uh, we also do lavender cooking demonstrations. We also have a lavender luncheon featuring lavender in each course. And then if you need a break from the lavender, we also still have wine tasting too. <laughs> so yeah, that was something I um, totally forgot about talking about prior uh, <laughs> to getting this all set up. But um, this is a, you know, this is one of the icons of, of Texas winery. You know, Texas wines, I mean, they've been around for a while. Um, I mean, if, if, if you live in Texas, you, you, you obviously have heard of Becker. <laughs> if you haven't heard of Becker and you live in Texas, then you must have just moved here. And come uh, see us. Yeah, come see so us. come on down here. This is one of the places that when I um, when I decided to come out to the Fredericksburg, well, we're actually in Stonewall, uh, but the Fredericksburg area, instead of going co closer to Austin, uh, this is one of the places I wanted to make sure I visited uh, just because it is so well known. Uh, everybody knows who they are, and they make some incredible wines here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up because I think we're at, we're at, we're at a good stopping point here, I guess. Um, uh, any of these wines, uh, I highly recommend all three of these wines. Uh, Viognier has always been a, a favorite of mine uh, with Becker. Um, and there's other Texas wineries who make some great Viognier's, but I know that I've had the Becker's and the Becker Viognier in the past, it's always been a favorite of mine. Um, the Claret and the Raven, uh, highly recommend uh, getting those. So all of you local Texas people, make sure you either stop by, pick it up, or find it your find it your local local retail shop or order online. If you're outside of Texas and you can't make it down here, uh, definitely hit the website. Uh, I'll have a link below. So stop by the website, have a link below to uh, to Becker's website, and uh, definitely check them out. Um, you have anything else you want to? say or <laughs> I would just say you know please come out and visit us and uh, we're open seven days a week Monday through Thursday 10 to 5 Friday and Saturday 10 to 6 and Sundays noon till 6 and again if you're not able to come out to the winery uh, anywhere in Texas we can do a direct ship to you if it's out of state it just depends on which state you're at but we hope you come and join us awesome all right so um, we're gonna wrap this up uh, as always, make sure you stop by the website, click the links above, friend me up, tell your friends about it, leave comments below, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.